evening and welcome to the 8th Annual Ralph Ellison Gala. We're here at the Ellison Hotel, a tribute hotel in honor of Ralph Ellison and is a collaborative with the Ralph Ellison Foundation. This venue will serve as our venue to host all future programming for the Ralph Ellison Foundation. So please join me in a night of hope, healing, and entertainment as we honor and pay tribute to Oklahoma City's own novelist, Ralph Waldo Ellison. Thank you. 
talk about Ralph Ellison. And uh, there's some people here who I know really value that legacy. I saw Senator George Young, of course, my friend Michael Owens right here, and there's several members of the board of the Ralph Ellison Foundation of Oklahoma. But this brings visibility to someone whose entire career was based on the concept of pointing out that people of color were invisible in this country. And all too often, great successful people from Oklahoma City of color have been invisible. And the Ralph Ellison Foundation exists to, to elevate people like Ralph Ellison and make sure that his legacy is remembered and that people in Oklahoma City know that Ralph Ellison wrote one of the seminal works, not just of American literature, but of the civil rights movement in the history of our country, and that he was born and raised right here in Oklahoma City. And that's why, you know, I'm so enthusiastic about this naming, about this property, that it's just another opportunity for people to dig into that history a little bit. People are going to walk into this hotel, locals and visitors, and wonder, what, well, what's the, why is it called Ellison? And we will, we will have an answer to their query, and we will help them learn a lot more about this important figure in American history, someone that we in Oklahoma City are rightfully proud of and that we want to elevate within and outside of our community. I'm very excited to introduce our next act. Jonathan Batista, he's a renowned ballet dancer. Oklahoma has a gym in its backyard, and I'm not sure people really understand his attributes. You know the name, you know the invisible man, but you're really not digging enough, enough to understand his work and his vision and his passion, and, uh, and we can learn from that. I think we can really change some things in the world today if we just start understanding what his writings are really about. And I think that's where organizations like the Foundation come into play. Uh, we're meeting people really where they are. And I think the big thematic questions that we have in this country about citizenship, about diversity, inclusivity, are at the heart of what the Foundation does. And so Ellison remains relevant. One example of uh, the outreach that the Foundation does is the Light Bulb Room series. So through a grant from Oklahoma Humanities several years ago, we were able to mount four really critical, um, thoughtful, difficult conversations throughout the state. So this series, the Light Bulb Room series, became uh, a national finalist for um, a Humanities Award. So. Um, it was a big deal and it continues to be a big deal and it's something that, that, uh, that we're quite proud of. As you all know, last year we had the opportunity to um, begin a program, Ellison's Young Readers, in collaboration with Community Partner, Full Circle Bookstore, and also a newly woman minority-owned bookstore, Bell Books and Boutique as well, assisting us with um, providing literacy opportunities um, for our young students. 
Um, this year, we had the opportunity to extend that and add um, art and dance to that programming. So uh, we are really looking forward to expanding that. And we have a new community partner, 612, in the Paseo. And they will be assisting us with some of that programming. And we have a big surprise in May for all of our uh, kids that love music. Several years ago, uh, Michael Owens had a really a vision about making uh, the Ralph Ellison Foundation be uh, nationwide, if not global. And that kind of inspiration led us to last year um, at the um, online gala deciding to launch the Ralph Ellison Foundation Society officially with an event we had this late uh, spring to be able to bring members in, first of all at, at our very local level, to to really buy into the idea of um, having regular events through a society that would be sustaining the Ralph Ellison Foundation through um, memberships. So there are levels of memberships and there are ways that folks can join who aren't living in the birthplace of Ralph Ellison, but who are living in other cities in the country. And in order to make that happen, we um, contacted a, a, a very energetic, a teacher from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, who is now our acting uh, Ralph Ellison Foundation Society president. So that's been really a, a really great thing for us to, to have a feet on the ground in another major city in this country and be able to really work from there with regular activities. A lot of the interest that I've seen on social media for the foundation has been around social justice. We look forward to developing more programming in this area and the interest continues to come in through social media. So I will continue to develop those partnerships and some new programming um, in that area. I mean, we appreciate all of our sponsors uh, and you will see uh, tonight uh, that we honor them. Uh, but Audible, uh, the CEO, founder, Don Katz, uh, a um, student of Mr. Ellison, which you will hear from as well uh, tonight, uh, is, is a great supporter of the foundation. Um, and it's, you know, you must be doing something right when you have such a great individual, uh, an iconic individual that sees the foundation and its work and the passion and I think the commitment that we have shown throughout the years to have his support uh, is invaluable to us. Uh, we truly cherish that. And in the Kirkpatrick Family Fund, uh, they have been with me since day one, uh, giving me advice. And I, I, I would lean into them and, and share, uh, you know, my vision. And they, they were so instrumental and guiding me um, throughout the years and they're just a great supporter of our work as well as uh, Cooper House um, you know the, the branding company that has uh, I mean, this hotel is amazing the work that they do and they have worked uh, with the foundation now for several years and um, I just I just love that group over there because they they understand they understand that um, buildings are more than simply brick and mortar. They understand that programs are more than something that's simply written on a piece of paper. You know, they understand that these things have life and they have been so, so um, involved with us in helping bring um, our vision to life. And so I just really appreciate Cooper House and, and the great work that they continue to do. And as I mentioned, uh, all of our sponsors are just, uh, I think they're, they're, they're amazing. They're amazing individuals and organizations that understand how important it is to uh, activate, uh, you know, their resources through organizations like ours into the community. If you'd like to be involved and want to grow with the Ralph Ellison uh, efforts, please visit ralphellisonfoundation.org and you can learn more about what we're doing, our vision, our mission, our goals. But it's also an opportunity for you to donate. And even if you can't volunteer or do other things and you want to be a part, please visit that website.
Fowler feels a social responsibility to give back to the community. And with community service, we have a voluntary incentive program. We actually pay employees to volunteer for um, 501c3 organizations in the community, and they don't have to use their paid time off. By the company doing that, then they're teaching the employees. If you think about it, our customers come from the community and we have an employee labor force that lives in that community. So regardless of where our dealerships are located, what ways can we give back to those communities that enrich the life of our customers and our employees? And, and that's why ultimately it's important for Fowler to give back to the community. If Fowler was not a quality organization, then I would not have stayed here for as long as I have. I am forever grateful to the Fowlers for providing those opportunities and the example that has been set by the Fowlers. Tonight we are elated to have with us again, Classen School of Advanced Studies Dance Department performing Flux. Gala would not be complete without the poet. I give you Quraysh Ali Lansana. America is woven of many strands. I would recognize them and let it so remain. Our fate is to become one and yet many. Ralph Ellison from Invisible Man. Sankofa. It is not taboo to fetch what is at risk of being left behind. 
from the Akan people of Ghana. It is the offerings of sacrifices that brings blessings. Neglect of sacrifices blesses no one. A Yoruba phrase. One, San, return. If one is alive for as long as we remember them, why do some choose only to remember what they choose? A selective amnesia, a pejorative redemption. Who gets to live again? Who determines another's story? What is history but gathered memories, our communal blood trees, our muddled antiquity, our woven realities? fed textbooks of erasure culled by desperation and fear. This space is reunion, a coming back to self, a seat at Big Mama's table after years of junk food narratives. Black joy, the first course, black struggle, the second course, black love, the third course, black truth, the menu, down home soul with African roots. All are welcome. Two, Ko, go. 1890 to 1907 to 1949 to 1957, from Trail of Tears to Senate Bill No. 1, to Afro-Indigenous, to Freedman, to Booster, to McCabe, to Gurley, to Smitherman, to Dungee, to Williams, to Stratford, to Ellison, to Miss Ada, to Miss Clara, to Miss Maxine, to Miss Carlicia, to Dr. Tiffany, to Michael Owens, to you, to now and tomorrow. Stay open yet grounded, Watoto. You have little idea where your journey will lead, but you must know from where you come. Three, Fa, look, seek, and take. This sanctuary sacred as we are here again and again and again. This year's recipient of our Shadow and Act Award is Anthony Davis. Mr. Davis is professor of music at the University of California at San Diego. He has performed throughout the world, has an extensive discography, has composed important orchestral, chamber, and choral works, and has composed and staged operas about the kidnapped, the enslaved, the wrongly convicted, and the culturally hijacked. His subjects include the fate of the enslaved people on the Amistad, Patricia Hearst, Malcolm X, and the Central Park Five. For this last, he won the 2020 Pulitzer Prize in Music. Mark Swed, the Los Angeles Times classical music critic, characterized some of the music in Central Park Five as bluesy, some as guides for our internalized outrage, and all of it as a force of nature. Opera News has called Professor Davis a national treasure. Last month, the New York Times Magazine praised him for the recent revival by the Detroit Opera of X, The Life and Times of Malcolm X. That opera premiered at the New York City Opera in 1986 and will be produced at the Metropolitan Opera next year. Anthony Davis has been honored by the National Opera Association, the Guggenheim Foundation, the American Academy of Arts and Letters, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Rockefeller Foundation, and many, many more. Ralph Ellison, in a 1970 letter to his intellectual sparring partner, critic Stanley Hyman, reacted as he often did against what he took to be a reductionist view of artists' racial identity. Ellison, it seemed, was forever saying that race is an indisputably large thing, but not the only thing, and perhaps especially in the arts. So he told a story to Hyman about a young white professor who asked Ellison how it felt to be able to go places where most black men can't go. Ellison, sensitive to nuance and complexity and proud of who he was, replied, what you mean is, how does it feel to be able to go places where most white men can't go? Ellison went on to explain that he was no abstraction, that he was more than his race, and that there were plenty of black doors that are closed to me, no less than they'd be to him. He, the white professor, simply couldn't imagine that such existed. Anthony Davis's work, or much of it, is unapologetically political and moral. It's often about justice and racial justice at that, whether achieved or not. I don't think it's too much to say that his art allows us to see things in new ways and to see new things. In so doing, it opens doors into and across communities 
that might have otherwise remained closed to us, whoever we are. For his visionary creativity, his constant and courageous moral reckoning, and for the sheer power and beauty of his music, the Ralph Ellison Foundation is very proud to award its Shadow and Act Award for 2022 to Professor Anthony Davis. I was so thrilled to hear I was going to be the recipient of the Shadow and Act Award from the Ralph Ellison Foundation. It was particularly meaningful to me because I met Ralph Ellison at the University of Iowa. My father was teaching there. Uh, he came to the to the University of Iowa for a conference, and I I got to speak with him at length a lot, and he mesmerized me with his stories about uh, Oklahoma and Earl, um, jazz in Oklahoma. You know, from Charlie Christian to Jimmy Blanton, and how his theory that bebop, a lot of the innovations of jazz that her occurred in the 1940s really started in the Southwest in Oklahoma. And uh, so Ralph, Ralph Ellison's legacy has meant so much to me. I wrote a, one of my early orchestra pieces was Notes from the Underground, which is of course inspired by The Invisible Man. And the two movements of the work were Shadow and Act, which is apropos to the award I'm receiving. Uh, and I also thought about <clears throat> how Ralph Ellison's intimacy with the blues is the way he ex extended the blues in literature, extended the idea of the conception of the blues, realizing that the blues is a universal expression and that can be through literature or through music. And for me, a lot of my career has been about those extensions, extending blues, extending the forms of African-American expression into opera, into orchestra music, into other forms. And also to, to and, and this is part of the award too, also in opening doors for everyone, just to think about, about music and art as being a form of activism, a form that uh, creation can be part of creating, trying to create a new world, a better world, particularly for African-Americans. Good evening, everyone. We hope you've enjoyed the program thus far. It is my honor and privilege at this time to do some recognitions uh, for the Ralph Ellison Foundation. At this time, we'd like to honor the Derek Mentor recipient. This year's recipient is Tina Camber. She's a full-time faculty member at the University of Central Oklahoma Department of Dance. Ms. Camber has a wealth of experience and in her choreography and dance and has gone nationally and across the world in doing things for universities and companies throughout the world. We're so excited for her to be here with us today. Please visit the program to learn more about what she's done and accomplished over the years. It is our pleasure and our privilege to present this award to none other than Tina Amber. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Um, I'm so grateful to be receiving this award named for Derek Minter on honoring his uh, life and legacy as a dance artist. Um, I'm very happy to um, have been a part of the gala performances for the past five years and I would like to thank Michael Owens and the foundation for, for um, honoring me with this award. I'm grateful and humbled and I thank you very much. Congratulations, Tina, from the family of Derek Mentor, mother, sister, and niece. Thank you for being the recipient of the 2022 Derek Mentor Award for Excellence in the Performing Arts. Your accolades speaks volumes. And always remember, the, the show must go on. It's always wonderful to have an international connection. And folks, I'm very excited to bring back again uh, from Scotland, Liam Ross.
I'm Josh Lifkin, and I teach English at Alderdice High School in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I'm also president of the Ralph Ellison Foundation Society. I'd like to share with you a project that I've been working on this summer in, a, in an interactive map of New York City specifically related to Ellison's time living and working there, with references to his novel Invisible Man. It's my hope that this map will serve both as a useful teaching tool and a resource for anyone interested in reading Ellison. The interactive map uses Google's My Maps service that lets you use the Google Maps infrastructure to attach information to locations and create custom shareable maps. The map utilizes a number of web and print-based resources for each location, including online historical documents and records, sites specific to the author's writing, including excerpts from Invisible Man and other essays that he wrote, and references to Arnold Rampersad's Ellison biography and excerpts from Ellison's collected letters. Let's take a brief tour of the page. When you first open the page, you'll see an expandable column on the left that provides information about the map, including locations color-coded according to Ellison's experience in New York City, places that may have influenced his writing of an invisible man, and locations actually mentioned in the novel. Let's take a look at a small sampling of them. The first location is the former site of the Lafargue Clinic in Harlem. A mental health site started by Frederick Wortham, Ellison wrote about it in Harlem is Nowhere that eventually appeared in Harper's in 1964. Characters such as Peter Wheatstraw may have been influenced by Ellison's look at Harlem's psychological trauma that followed the stock market crash. You'll see that each entry includes historical information about the site, its relation to Ellison's life or his writing, and sources specific to that information. In this case, you also get a link to Harlem is Nowhere. Finally, each map point may also contain a historical or contemporary image of that location. The next location is the former site of the Paragon Paint Factory on Long Island, which may have served as an inspiration for Liberty Paints in chapters 10 and 11 of Invisible Man. The map also includes the A.C. Horn Paint Company. According to Rampersad, Ellison briefly worked here and it may have also helped influence his description of Liberty Paints in the novel. Following that, let's take a look at the street corner where Ellison interviewed Leo Gurley in 1939 as part of his work for the Federal Writers Project. Here, Ellison recorded information concerning folk traditions of African Americans who had migrated from the South. In Gurley's interview, Ellison may have found the roots for characters such as Peter Wheatstraw, the yam vendor, and especially B.P. Reinhardt, who embodied the classic notion of a trickster found in such folklore. Here the location includes a link to Ellison's interview with Gurley, historical image, and other related resources. Next up is the location referenced in Chapter 20 of Invisible Man, where the narrator witnesses Todd Clifton murdered by a policeman. This scene is located in front of Bryant Park. For this entry, you'll find a brief account of the scene, information about how Ellison had excerpted it in the collection of The Angry Black, including a link to that that has an image of the book and its contents, as well as a quotation from Ellison's 1964 letter to Joseph Frank that eerily recalls a recent scene of life imitating art, and finally, a historical image of that location. The final map entry I want to share with you is Ralph and Fanny Ellison's home on Riverside Drive in Harlem, specifically the Beaumont Apartments. This entry includes a link that connects the location with Ellison's literary career, Fanny's obituary, and other related resources about the area, including an image of the apartment building. The map currently includes 27 locations, each color-coded to represent sites related to Ellison's time in New York City, those that served as an influence on his writing of Invisible Man, and those pertaining to actual places mentioned in the novel. The plan is to embed this resource on the Ralph Ellison Foundation website in the very near future and give, a permanent, give it a permanent linkable home. It's my hope that more locations will be added to the map in coming months. As noted in the information column on the map, users can suggest location ideas or corrections so we can continue to improve this free resource for anyone interested in Ralph Ellison's time in New York City and his writing of Invisible Man and other pieces set in the area. Thank you.
Today I'd like to just play for you a piece that sort of one of my early pieces that um, demonstrates kind of the, the way in which I extend the blues, how I extend blues forms and, and to create something new. So this is a piece called uh, appropriately of blues and dreams. Don Katz is the founder and executive director of Audible. He started it in 1995. Audible also provides a home for actors, writers, and other creatives, and gives them a, a new medium to tell their story. Through Don's leadership and vision, Audible also has been part of the revitalization of the city of Newark, which is New Jersey's largest city. Don's leadership and philosophy has been shaped by Ralph Ellison, who was Don's mentor when he was a student at NYU, 
Mr. Ellison supported Don in his first career as an award-winning magazine journalist and book writer. And it was Ellison's passion for music and the sound of words that helped lead to the creation of Audible. And it was Ellison's passion for music and the sound of words that helped lead to the creation of Audible. Don Katz. Hello, everyone. It's, uh, it's wonderful to be with you. I'm Don Katz. I'm, I'm founder and executive chairman at Audible. And as some of you know, uh, I was Ralph's student years and years ago. Um, it's just wonderful to be back with you. I have such admir admiration for the organization. Uh, Audible's a proud sponsor. Um, I was incredibly thrilled to be honored at the beginning of 2020 at the uh, at the galley it met, met so many amazing people in OKC and um, and I, I just love what the organization does keeping Ralph's legacy alive the community focus uh, the, the, the the entire idea of um, you know engaging the community at so many levels in his memory it's 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 just it, it's moving whenever I look at it it's um, it's it's gratifying and uh, and you know, thank you for all for being being a part of it. It's also fun to work with a, a really really exciting entrepreneur in, in Michael, um, and uh, you know, it's it's uh, two two Midwestern boys who ended up finding meaning in other places, as far as I can tell. And uh, you know, Audible is uh, is a very very large company now. You know, we're headquartered in Newark, you know, for a reason. And Ralph is in the minds of everyone who works here uh, on a consistent basis. We renovated a huge cathedral uh, in the middle of Newark, and it's a, it's a tech center. It's got an unbelievable architectural statement. And Ralph's words soar in architectural relief up as soon as you come in. And I'd invite anyone who's making a trip to the New York area to, to come out and, and check it out. Um, you know, so you might also remember from my words uh, back at the gala, you know, I had two careers that were completely empowered by what Ralph taught me during those long afternoons when I had him to myself at NYU, something that many, many people can't believe that I actually was able to spend time with him, know him, and have a sense that he cared about me and what happened to me and, and what I thought about life and literature. Um, the first was a 20-year writing career. Um, I started when I was 23 at a, a really good run. I, I wrote with my ears, partly because of the way Ralph helped me understand, you know, the power of the sound of, of, of literature. Um, I, I, uh, I went on and, uh, and started Audible, and Audible is really a, a, a living testament to what I learned from Ralph. I mean, I knew very, very early that American literature, the voices of Stephen Crane and Mark Twain, were a function of listening to the storytelling traditions and the vernacular culture that Ralph made me so aware of. And every day, something comes up that just it reminds me of it in my relationship with him and my thoughts of how important his memory is uh, comes back to me. The other day, uh, there was a lot of news about this uh, uh, Barack Obama and Mrs. Obama's um, um, production focus and audio focus is all going to be about Audible. It was kind of big news. And in the process, I got to spend some time with the President and Mrs. Obama. And when I got to the point of talking about Ellison, boy, did he light up because he is considers himself an Ellisonian and, uh, and was very much um, you know, a student of him and understands, you know, what he brought to American culture as a writer and an intellectual. Just uh, not that long ago, I got to uh, go to Philadelphia, and uh, there's a, a, an ode to Ralph that I helped um, create and, and produce called Jazz in the Key of Ellison. And uh, it debuted in, 19, in 2019. Uh, uh, in Newark, and it's a uh, it's an amazing evening of Ralph's words and the jazz and the music he studied and loved at, at such a deep level. It it opened up in Newark uh, with Wynton Marcellus 
uh, with uh, Joe Morton, who's the voice of Ralph Ellison, a great reading of Invisible Man, and Bob O'Mealy, a great Ellison scholar. And it's a, it's, a, it's a really incredible evening. So it went on the road. Obviously, COVID put a hit into that, but it appeared in San Diego and in, uh, in Miami. And I got to go back home where I'm from in Chicago at uh, Symphony Hall and talk about this. And we, there was a talk back with Bob O'Mealy with all sorts of people interested in Ellison would come to listen to us talk. So I got to tell President Obama that just the other night, I got to tell a crowd in Philadelphia that my teacher, Ralph Ellison, could hear the stories of slaves when he listened to jazz and the blues. Um, such a special man. Uh, he was my teacher, as I said. Um, he, I don't pretend to, you know, be a, a profound scholar, uh, but I am certainly someone whose life was impacted by his. And, uh, and every time um, I talked to Michael or I found out all the amazing things uh, the organization, the foundation is doing in, in Oklahoma City, I'm just proud to be associated with it. So thanks to all of you for, for what you do.
Good evening, I am Josh Slifkin. I hope you're enjoying this year's gala and invite you to join the Ralph Ellison Foundation Society. Our goal is to foster a diverse community of readers who are interested in discussing Ellison's work, including its literary significance, as well as its ongoing value in the 21st century. The Ralph Ellison Foundation Society has four membership levels, starting at $50 a year, with increasing benefits for each successive level. These include book talks, discussions with noted authors, special film screenings, museum tours, annual membership gifts, and other invitation-only events. Please consider joining the Ralph Ellison Foundation Society in, inter in interacting with others who admire the work of this great American author. Thank you. Next, we have a musical selection by Michael Stafford.
It is with great pleasure that I introduce to you our next act, Sylvia Arthur, with the Library of Africa and the African Diaspora. She comes to us from Accra, Ghana, with a special reading of Mr. Ellison. Please enjoy. Hi, my name is Sylvia Arthur. I'm the founder of the Library of Africa and the African Diaspora here in Accra, Ghana. And LOTAD, as we call it for short, is a library, archive, writing residency, and uh, Becoming Museum, dedicated to the collection of African and diaspora writers from the late 19th century to the present day. Um, if you come into our library, you will see that um, all on our walls, we have pictures of African and diaspora writers. And when we say diaspora, we mean uh, people of African descent who are in the Americas, the Caribbean, Europe, all over the world where there are, are black people. We have um, the pictures of the writers on the wall. Uh, we have everybody from Chinua Achebe, Tony Morrison, uh, Maya Angelou, and of course we have Mr. Ralph Ellison, which is why we're here today. Um, to be honest, when we were thinking about who to put on the walls, there was never any doubt that we would have Mr. Ellison on our wall. Um, obviously, uh, Invisible Man is an iconic uh, book. Also, his uh, short stories from Flying Home, and it was just, there was never any doubt, as I said, that Mr. Ellison would be there amongst the greats of African descent. And so it's an honor for me to be here, to be able to read um, from one of my favorite works by Mr. Ellison, which is Jaime's Bull. Now, Jaime's Bull was originally published in 1933. I believe it was the first story that he ever had published. And when I reread it recently, it really did put me in mind of what's happening in the world today, especially with the war in the Ukraine. Now, Jaime's Bull is the story of um, a group of men who would ride the trains um, in this era of the Great Depression, obviously, uh, and racism and the civil rights uh, uh, struggle, uh, and apartheid actually in, in America. And so they would be riding these trains. And it, as I said, it put me in mind of the war in Ukraine, um, specifically because at the start of the war, when people were leaving the country, Africans who had moved to Ukraine um, primarily to study medicine, but other things also wanted to uh, be evacuated from Ukraine. And unfortunately, many of them were stopped from loading onto these trains because the people who were guarding it uh, were saying that it's for Ukrainians only or interpreted as white people only. So again, I saw the parallels between uh, Jaime's bull and this uh, particular situation that's uh, still ongoing. And also because in the story, um, it's a white uh, guy who's riding the train, who is um, confronting the bull and the bull being a metaphor for obviously the, the train guards that they would have on the train to um, kick off people who weren't supposed to be on the train. So it actually reminded me of the fact that it was a white person who killed the bull but it was the black people who ultimately would pay the price for that. And again, as I say, with what's happening in the world today, this is not um, 
an African war or a black war, but black people are still paying the price. So they were some of the reasons why I was attracted to Jaime's Bull. So I will read actually from the beginning of Jaime's Bull. Um, and like I said, you know, class is in fact uh, supposed to be a leveler in this story to show that poor people, whether they were white or whether they were black, um, were still suffering from the system. And actually, War is also thought of as being a leveller, but in reality, we've seen that actually it's not really. But anyway, I'm reading from the beginning of Jaime's Bull. We were just drifting, going no place in particular, having long ago given up hopes of finding jobs. We were just knocking around the country, just drifting, 10 black boys on an L&N freight. From Birmingham, we had swung up to the World's Fair at Chicago, where the bull had met us in the yards and turned us around and knocked a few lumps on our heads as souvenirs. If you've ever had a bull stand so close, he can't miss and hit you across the rump as you crawled across the top of a boxcar. And when you try to get out of the way because you knew he had a gun as well as a loaded stick, you've had him measure a tender spot on your head and let go with his loaded stick like a man cracking black walnuts with a hammer. And if when you started to climb down the side of the car because you didn't want to jump from the moving train, like he said, you've had him step on your fingers with his heavy boots and grind them with his heel like you do a cockroach. And then if you didn't let go, he beat you across the knuckles with his loaded stick till you did let go. And when you did, you hit the cinders and found yourself tumbling and sliding on your face away from the train faster than the telephone poles alongside the tracks. Then you can understand why we were glad as hell we only had a few lumps on the head. Especially when you remember that the Chicago Bulls hate black bums about as much as Texas Slim, who will kill a Negro as quick as he'll crack down on a blackbird sitting on a fence. Bulls are pretty bad people to meet if you're a bum. They have head whipping down to a science and they're always ready to go into action. They know all the places to hit, to change a bone into jelly. And they seem to feel just the place to kick you to make your backbone feel like it's going to fold up, like the old collapsible drinking cups we used when we were kids. Once, a ball hit me across the bridge of my nose and I felt like I was coming apart like a cigarette floating in a urinal. They can hit you on your head and bust your shoes. But sometimes the bulls get the worst of it. And whenever a bull is missing at the end of a run and they find him all cut up and bleeding, they start taking all the black boys off the freights. Most of the time, they don't care who did it because the main thing is to make some black boy pay for it. Now, when you hear that we're the only bums that carry knives, you can just put that down as bull talk. Because what I'm fixing to tell you about was done by an offy bum named Heinemi from Brooklyn. And now, the University of Central Oklahoma Dance Department. Mm -hmm. 